Hey, what's up, everyone? Well, a lot of people, when they think about propagation, they think about starting seeds. And today, we're going to go over how and why we propagate junipers that we use in bonsai using cuttings rather than seeds that they produce. So these are seed cones that I picked off one of my Rocky Mountain junipers that uh, came from the wild, a collected tree. And similar to the Rocky Mountain junipers, Chinese junipers create small little cones like this that are kind of brightly, brightly colored. And you would think that this would be a perfectly reasonable, good way to propagate a juniper. But as it turns out, it's actually quite difficult because the seeds have a dormancy requirement. And so if you just take these cones, the whole cone and plant it into a pot, uh, assuming that the seed is viable, in other words, the, the plant that produced the seed had enough resources to actually create a viable embryo, uh, it will take two years for these to grow. And that's because the, the embryos are dormant. And in order to break that dormancy, it requires a warm period and then a cold period and then a warm period and then a cold period. And so in order to, in order to propagate junipers a little bit more uh, speedily, we can use cuttings as a technique. And not only does this get us around the problem of the embryo dormancy in the seedling junipers, it also gives us a uniform uh, color texture basically because we're cloning the plants instead of using genetically different plants from each seed we get a consistent result in terms of how we expect the plant to grow and um, the color and appearance of the plant a lot of what i'm going to go through today is just the way that i do things and uh, I learned a lot of my propagation techniques by reading this book. It's the reference manual of woody plant propagation and the main author's name is Dirr, D-I-R-R. It's kind of like an encyclopedia of propagation. It's listed by species and for each species listed there are instructions about how you should propagate whether that's by cutting or seeds or tissue culture. Um, and for Juniperus chinensis, which is listed right here, there uh, are some instructions here. And basically what they say, basically what they say is that there are a million ways to propagate a juniper by cutting. And so you just have to pick one and see if it works for you in your location. One of the challenges with creating juniper cuttings is finding the material to take the cuttings from. If you have junipers already, it's fantastic. You can basically take the strong growth off of them and turn it into more plants. But if your trees aren't actively growing or you have old refined bonsai, you probably don't have the type of growth that you need in order to make good cuttings. So both of these are two-year-old cuttings that I propagated from nursery stock and they're relatively healthy, but this one is obviously a lot more vigorous than this one and the reason i say that is that this one has this probably nine inch ten inch long shoot that it's created just this growing season in the last like six months and what that tells me is that there's also a lot of good root growth up going on down here and that the plant's metabolism is really on in high gear now in a, in a mature bonsai or in a bonsai that you're trying to contain, you're not going to allow this kind of thing to happen because junipers, in order, in order to make new branches, this is what you need. You need these long shoots in order to make a new branch. These weaker shoots that are just sort of pieces of foliage, each one of them has the potential to be a branch, but it's not nearly as likely that you're gonna get branches in any sort of a reasonable amount of time from these tips as it is from these guys. And let's look at another example here. So this is a large uh, branch <laughs> that I just cut off uh, an old nursery piece of nursery stock that I have in a three gallon can. And despite the fact that it has some big pieces of wood here, these, uh, this type of growth in my experience is not quite as useful as this type of growth in terms of propagation. <clears throat> so, when you have material that you're that you 
are wanting to use for propagation, and this is a good example, you have to kind of look at which parts of this material are suitable and whether or not you should even bother using them. So this foliage uh, on this side was facing up. In other words, it was getting a lot of sun. And if I flip this over, the foliage on this side was getting a lot less sun. And if you examine it closely, you can kind of see uh, that this foliage is kind of looser and it's getting enough sun to survive because there wasn't a lot of foliage on the other side, but it's definitely not as dense or um, healthy as the foliage on the top side. So the best I can do on uh, getting cuttings from this is to kind of cut off these small three inch long branches and make a small cutting like this. And that's a perfectly reasonable cutting. It has about uh, three quarters of an inch of a stem here that we can use to stick into the soil. That will work fine. These little bits, uh, are useless in terms of cuttings and this one is probably a little bit too small but you could try uh, you could try sticking it anyway it's mm, maybe about two inches long with an three quarters of an inch stem and a, and a tuft of foliage and there's plenty of other foliage on here but a lot of this stuff is not super not super vigorous and so I can go in here and trim off kind of like the dead little twigs or whatever and I've got this kind of dinky little branch that wasn't growing quickly uh, as it was and now I've cut it off and I'm going to ask it to create roots. This type of material will root but the difference between this and taking a cutting off of something that's growing like this is that if I take this cutting and I strip off these lower needles that are gonna sort of end up in the soil anyway. If I take this cutting and this cutting and I put them into a container to root, uh, this one will root twice as quickly as this one. And essentially in the first year of growth, this one will put out like a whole nother shoot worth of growth. Whereas this one will sit there and sort of start to form uh, a shoot and so it'll take a whole extra year or maybe two years for this one to catch up to this one and that's why it's important for you to really evaluate the health of the plant that you're taking the cuttings from is probably it's probably the most important factor in terms of the speed of development of the cutting after you've taken it so if you don't have a choice you can you can start with this kind of cutting but if you do have a choice start with a cutting that's really more like three or four inches long with a one inch stem and the you don't want the thickness of this portion to be excessive so i don't want like an inch thick piece of wood here or even a quarter inch thick piece of wood the ideal size is really more like uh, less than the size of a pencil, kind of like a matchstick kind of size, maybe 1 16th to 1 8th inch. Blah, 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 blah. go through a few of these as examples so here is the cutting that I took uh, first and that's from a strong shoot from one of the one of the plants that I propagated a while ago that's going to be really fast growing and it's going to be 99% uh, chance of rooting here's a, a you know a big cutting that has a lot of bushiness to it but isn't as much of a strong shoot this one's going to root fine. It might lag behind this one in just that the the tip uh, that's here, these tips that are here might take a little while to take off after it's rooted, but this is very likely to root. And this is about as big as I go. So this is maybe about five inches in total. And the base here is about the size of a, of a regular standard pencil. Now, 
let's look at a couple of non-ideal ones. This one has like a weird kind of uh, hook there and there's not a lot of foliage and it's certainly, uh, it's not weak, but it's also not like a really strong. When you have material like this, if you're really trying to maximize the number of cuttings that you get to root, you can, you can dip it and stick it. But um, that weird crook is gonna make it harder to stick and I would say that it's also gonna make it less likely that it'll actually take. Um, so here's sort of like a, another reasonably large, good size cutting that uh, should be pretty successful. Let me pull out, so I already discarded all the ones that were, were obviously too small, uh, but there were some borderline ones and I wanted to look at those. So this, you know, this type of cutting, again, it will root, sometimes it will only form a callus at the base and not send out roots for quite some time. And then, you know, two years on when, when you know, some of the plants are, are quite a bit bigger and have sent out eight inch shoots like this one, this one will be sitting there and maybe only be like an, an additional inch longer with not much more foliage mass than it has right now. So it's just a, it's a potentially very slow uh, way to propagate, uh, but if it's your only option, it can work and give you more plants couple more things about uh, cuttings. It's always tempting when you have like a long strong shoot like this one to kind of cut it up into pieces and I do usually do that but <clears throat> you have to be a little bit careful about which parts of the of it that you use and so if we're going to use a side shoot like this as well as a one inch long or longer piece of the main part of the the main stem that you cut off. Uh, this is kind of called a heel cutting and I would recommend that it seems like these root only when this part of the cutting is relatively young. So if you have a side shoot like this and you include an older piece of wood here, that's gonna be less likely to root and what ends up ha happening often is that we just get roots coming out from the junction of the two, which means that this is kind of irrelevant. So this is a good cutting, but just be careful about how old the wood is on that type of cutting. These guys are all too small. This I will take the bottom growth off of and then I'm going to cut this into two different pieces. Now this upper section you would think might not work but it actually works really well and these are still very vigorous and then this will be even more vigorous than that upper section. Now that we've got our cuttings, let's talk a little bit about the process of actually sticking them. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this and some people say uh, that you have to use a grafting knife in order, to, in order to slice the end of the cutting instead of using a pair of scissors. I've done thousands of these and I know that uh, the chances of you getting rooty, roots from here as a result of using a grafting knife versus a sharp pair of scissors is minimal in my experience. So the extra effort that would go into cutting a bunch of these with a grafting knife is only really gonna be worth it if you are taking just a few cuttings or you're short on uh, stock because the, the difference in the take rate is not significant. And one thing to remember is that sometimes the roots are not even coming from the cut point here, they're actually coming from along the stem that's stuck into the media above that cut point. So the, the grafting knife technique, while perfectly suitable and usable, it avoids smashing the, the, the tissue and separating the cambium and the bark from the wood that's on the inside. But at the same time, if you have a properly sharpened pair of scissors, then you should have no problem with making small cuttings like this. If you're trying to make cuttings that are significantly larger, then shaving off some material from the end with a grafting knife could be something that's a little bit more useful, but I find that the larger cutting, something that is, you know, 10, 12 inches long, they have a much lower success rate once they're stuck. Rooting hormone is basically a synthetic pr product that is derived from the natural hormones of plants. In other words, it was discovered that this hormone in plants will induce rooting if applied in excess. So 
This particular uh, hormone is Hormax number eight, and there's a Hormax number three here. The type of rooting hormone that you use is not really super important. However, you should be paying attention to the concentration of the active ingredient. And that's the difference, the only difference really between these two. This is 8,000 parts per million of IBA and this is 3,000 parts per million. So this is more than twice as concentrated. The reason there are different concentrations is that different types of plants can be burned by concentrations that are too high or not really react if the concentration is too low. So for junipers, I've been using Hormax number eight for quite some time. I've also used Clonex, I've used Dip and Grow, I've used uh, a couple others that are not coming to mind at the moment. If you're using a liquid solution, the longer you dip it in the solution, uh, the more active this the, it will be in terms of its effect on the tissue. With the powders, you're just kind of dipping it and then uh, sticking it into the media and the powder stays in contact so there's more time for it to uh, actually take action. Prior to, to dipping I recommend that you actually treat your plants with uh, some sort of fungicide. Zerotol works really well and you can just fill up a bucket with Zerotol, plunge all the, the cuttings in, pull them back out and then um, the cuttings will be wet and the powder will stick to the end of the cutting. A little bit of it's going to get knocked off as you put it in the soil. I don't usually worry about that. And the soil that I'm using is the same soil that I use for a lot of seedling and, and young plant growth, which is 80% perlite and about 20% uh, cocoa coir. And what I'm doing here is basically I'm just going to stack all these cuttings uh, one by one into here as close together as I can get them because we don't want things to dry out. We don't want too much light getting to the cuttings. And so the, the putting them close together kind of seems to be more effective. I usually actually use a, um, a 17 inch Anderson propagation flat to do this, which has a mesh bottom. But I wanted to demonstrate that you can actually use any container that you have on hand. I wouldn't use a mesh sided container because it, they'll have a, a tendency to dry out a little bit too quickly. But uh, I've just have like an old leftover one gallon container here that I'm using and that will provide plenty of room for these roots to grow. All right, so filled up this container and um, let's just talk a little bit about aftercare. Now, normally I use a, an Anderson flat and then in terms of aftercare, I do this in the fall. So right now it's the middle of October here in San Francisco. And for the next couple of months, I'll just leave these outside in a shady area. Um, on my on my back deck and I'll put them on top of a seedling heat mat. If you've never used a seedling heat mat before, it's basically like an old incandescent light bulb, but where the heat is spread out very evenly and you can hook it up to a small thermostat. They're available online in multiple places and it just sort of like uh, something that you would use to keep chicken eggs warm if you're trying to hatch chickens or something like that. And But the heat uh, on the bottom of the container has a really good effect on warming up the soil and that stimulates root growth. So in a pot that's a little bit uh, deeper like this one where there's more soil between where the actual uh, stems are and the heat mat, you'd probably want to set a little bit higher. But let me just show you so this is an Anderson flat. Usually I will set the heat, this directly on the heat mat and set the heat mat to about 75 degrees. And so if it's like, you know, 45, 50 degrees outside, there's a little probe that goes in here and that heat mat stays on as long as the soil is uh, below that, whatever you've set it to, which in my case is 75 degrees. So junipers don't tend to really love being misted on a regular basis. You can definitely get them wet, but if you have something like an electronic leaf or any other system where they're getting misted every few minutes, it can tend to cause rot in the foliage. So the, the 
warmth on the bottom and just like a cool moist environment uh, for the the foliage that's not too intense in terms of light is a good good place to start now a couple of months later you will have roots on your cuttings but you won't have much in the way of growth and so I'm just gonna pull apart I want to show you guys this flat was struck just about exactly a year ago I actually have a tag on it here it was uh, October 9th of 2020 it's uh, I think it's October 15th or so of 2021 right now I used Clonex and these are were, were sanitized using uh, zero tall and I'm seeing that like there's relatively good growth here but these have been in a little bit too much shade so they're not quite as robust but you can see that a lot of these actually have two three inch whips on them in that first year worth of growth all right let's pull apart this flat and see what we ended up with I've separated these into three piles roughly by size and I just want to show you a couple examples. So these once again are a year on from the cutting process that we just went through and you can see that the, the bigger cuttings all have more top growth on them and they have significantly more roots like three to four times the number of roots as some of the smaller cuttings. And if you look at the smaller cuttings it's like it's just completely obvious that uh, that smaller amount of growth, that smaller um, amount of wood that they started with and the smaller number of tips that they started with just leads to a slower result. And so unless you're specifically trying to create very, very tiny plants, as in the case with, you know, Mame, and you don't think that you can do it with a larger cutting and then and then cutting it back and shaping it this type of cutting is definitely going to take you a lot longer to to get to an, an actual bonsai kind of size so the the needles that have been in contact with the soil will rot and that's why we pull off all of the ones that are on the on the bottom when we're sticking them or prior to sticking them and, and dipping them in the hormone and then what you see sometimes is that you also get these these little roots along the stem, the buried portion of the stem. Uh, and in this case, there's a good radial uh, spread of roots all coming from one location. But again, the amount of root here and the amount of foliage is very small. And so it's very likely that this will take an extra year to catch up to the ones that are over here. And here's a result. Uh, that is somewhat problematic in in this small one we've got it was probably buried a little bit too far so we've got some of this foliage and stem rotting uh, and meanwhile the tree has rooted almost exclusively from well above the cut point you can see this tissue is callus tissue and then it has rooted from this junction and I've seen this quite a few times there's no point in keeping this it's already died as you can see so I can just knock that off, um, but that cutting just got smaller. And so if you're, if you, again, if you're looking to make anything other than something extremely tiny, this type of cutting is not going to get you there as quickly as some of the larger cuttings. All right, well, I hope that helped you uh, in your propagation efforts. Uh, if you like this video, check out some of the other videos in our channel and uh, please like the video and subscribe to our channel if you find these videos useful. We'll see you next time.